Good morning, everybody. Uh, apples, and I'd particularly like to thank the organisers, um, uh, the invitation from the Canadian Navy and from, uh, from Royal Lawrence University and from the Centre. It's been a pleasure to be here, but particularly to Jim Cotillion. Um, I'm going to move fairly briskly because I've got quite a lot to get through in 20 minutes. Uh, my purpose is not to go into the detail uh, of what is happening uh, on the water. My fellow uh, panelists will know far more about that than, than I do. Uh, my purpose is to try to give you some background as to why we are where we are and try to put some of those comments in, in context and to put forward an interpretation of uh, why this has happened, as I said, and uh, how it might uh, play out in the future. A moment of tension has passed. Um, like piracy uh, everywhere throughout the world, this is a, a landward problem uh, with a seaward face. Um, and an extremely serious problem. We're probably experiencing in the Gulf of Guinea uh, greater economic losses and probably has a greater economic impact than piracy uh, anywhere else. The inspiration uh, for what is taking place and what is going on uh, is clearly based uh, in oil, oil extraction, coupled with elite greed, uh, coupled with the perception that people who live in the Niger Delta region, uh, that they're receiving very little return uh, from the billions of dollars that have been lifted from beneath their own feet. Their grievances cover everything from poverty, uh, high youth unemployment, remember that the Delta is home to 22% of the Nigerian population, 62% of whom are under the age of 30. Uh, they feel that they've been discriminated against by the international oil companies, the IOCs, and they believe that the wealth that comes out of their region, which basically funds the rest of Nigeria, um, has been manipulated by various extra-regional groups. And they're also faced by environmental disaster. There's been the equivalent of an Exxon Valdez spill every year in the region for the last 50 years. So drawing a sharp distinction between what is criminal and what is politically motivated in this conflict uh, is, is wrong um, There is a deep sense of injustice in the region uh, that has a long history and goes back a long way. The default response to that, perhaps unfortunately, has been securitization uh, rather than political or economic reform. Now I want to offer you two interpretations. Uh, of Nigeria's uh, present and its future. Uh, the first is essentially positive. Um, Post-independence, Nigeria was seen as it was, it was probably going to be economically and socially the most successful country uh, in Africa. It was going to be Africa's success story. And the belief now, under the positive interpretation, is it's beginning to realize that expectation. We've seen a growth uh, over this last decade, a very respectable uh, growth of around 8 percent including the non-oil sector. We've got a large and growing population of 162 million people, amongst which there is an emerging middle class, which is attracting uh, the interest of, of, of international business. We're seeing the stabilization of Nigerian politics into a stable democracy with an open and possibly the most uh, free-thinking and free-spirited uh, uh, media in the whole of Africa. There are troubles, there's a concession that there are troubles. The troubles in the Delta, however, are being curtailed by the amnesty, which obviously we'll talk about a little more. Uh, and the only real threat is Boko Haram, the, the Islamist, uh, Islamist group in, in northern Nigeria, which has some connection uh, to Al-Qaeda. Now the second uh, interpretation uh, is somewhat darker. Critically, that all the government at all levels is corrupt. Uh, the current president, uh, good luck, uh, Jonathan, uh, won his election fairly, but a large proportion of the population see his uh, rise as being uh, illegitimate. Illegitimate because there has been, uh, there is a convention in Nigeria that a northerner should hold the presidency, then a southerner, then a northerner, then a southerner. Uh, because jo good luck, Jonathan was the deputy to a northern president who died in office, and there is a belief amongst the northern constituencies that he should have stood aside in the subsequent election, which he did not do. Consequently, there was electoral violence, which Boko Haram has capitalized upon, uh, exploiting deep-seated uh, 
divisions within the society to spread its militancy into the, the country's middle belt, out of the northern region into the middle belt. As far as the, as far as the Niger Delta is concerned, uh, it's rich in oil, uh, but remains rich in resentment. Um, there, there is, uh, billions have been, uh, billions have disappeared from the region, uh, provoking violence. Uh, the tensions have not been solved by the amnesty. Corruption remains a serious problem. 26,000 militants uh, may have uh, surrendered, but the government, continuing government inaction on the social and economic fronts has encouraged the rise of what they themselves call third phase uh, militants. Now, there's undoubtedly truth in both uh, interpretations. Um, but crime is a national epidemic, and people do see that the repressive measures that have been taken in the Delta have been making the situation worse. I'd suggest that Nigeria has four uh, ingrained uh, challenges. Population, wealth inequalities, corruption, and urban expansion. Um, population is exploding. Uh, we could be adding 70 million uh, people within the next 10 years or so. And uh, I know all population extrapolation figures are somewhat uh, hopeful. But there has been estimations of up to half a billion more people uh, by the end of the century. That is coupled uh, with wealth uh, uh, inequalities. Uh, uh, Nigeria might have added the second largest uh, economy, second to South Africa. Uh, but wealth inequalities account for about 70%. 70% of the population are living below the poverty line. That in turn feeds uh, corruption. 85% of the oil income goes to 1% of the population, and of that, 40% disappears abroad. It costs the country between four and eight billion dollars uh, every year, and the country is dominated by one political party, the People's Democratic Party, which naturally gives it enormous patronage and influence. Urban expansion. We've seen Lagos. Uh, it's, it was quite sure, somewhere between 12 and 17 million people, which probably makes it the largest city in Africa and probably the fourth largest uh, in the world. We're seeing the drift of the cities that we're seeing throughout the, the world's population. Uh, but a lot of people are finding not wealth, uh, but a slum uh, existence. It forms part of the same part of uh, Nigeria as the, the Niger Delta. The, the landscape is very similar. Um, a region where communities have been subjected to unregulated development and pollution, inadequate you know, social sewage disposal, poor fisheries management in the Delta, specifically loss of mangrove and coastal erosion. So sharing this very fragile coastal belt, the Niger Delta, environmental problems are unlikely to increase as the population increases. Now, this presentation is primarily about uh, Nigeria, but I need to pause just for a moment and say that it, Nigeria is not alone. This is a comment made uh, two years ago by the just retired head of the British um, uh, Serious Organised Crime Agency, referring to his experience of working in the Gulf of Guinea Generally. Returning to Nigeria, the divisions in the Delta. Independence came in 1960, and at that stage the country was divided into three regions. But independence did not solve the tensions that had existed within that community for decades. Probably not. In 1967, those tensions led to a civil war, first a coup, then a counter-coup, uh, then a breakaway uh, by the eastern region as the Republic of Biafra. That was defeated by 1970. Uh, the dominant the tribe, the Igbo, uh, was subjected to, not was subjugated uh, to northern interests. The region's minority tribes, and there are about 40 distinct groups speaking up to 120 different languages and dialects, uh, had generally sided uh, with the Northerners uh, against the Igbo, uh, fearful of Igbo domination if the Igbo uh, were to win. But they, post the Northern victory, uh, were cast aside. Henceforth, oil revenues were collected uh, centrally and dispersed centrally. They became a federal government responsibility completely. 
And then we see the start of that struggle that has characterized Nigeria ever since between the world states and the non oil producing states. The piracy began shortly after that, the piracy that we know now. Piracy is a product of economic dislocation. I can't think of an example when it hasn't been. Uh, we saw, this is not an area that's been historically played by piracy, but we saw piracy, piracy did occur in the late 19th century and involved the Ijol, the same, one of the same tribes that are involved now. The Western Ijol uh, were excluded from trading opportunities with the incoming uh, British, their opponents with the Itsekiri, uh, another local minority tribe, who at the time, towards the end of the 19th century, were capable of building a trading empire and enforcing it in the 1890s with up to 100 war canoes, uh, each manned, uh, manned by a total of 20,000 warriors. Piracy after that declined and did not reoccur until really just after the, uh, the, the termination of the Biafra War. Oil was discovered in 1956, uh, and by 1970, corruption was widespread. Not that corruption was specific to oil. Corruption has been a problem in Nigeria and in this region uh, for decades, so even before independence. That corruption was fed, the fuel was fueled by the OPEC price rise in 1973. That in turn triggered a whole range of wasteful government expenditures, including large prestige projects, which sucked in cement uh, from outside the country. And you've got the creation, if you recall it, in the later centers of the, of the cement armada that sat off Lagos often for months and months and months at a time, waiting to unload in inadequate uh, harbor conditions. That provoked the piracy of the time, swarm attacks uh, involving uh, multiple boats, multiple piracies, usually based on inside information. Um, and by the first quarter of 1981, there were attacks in the, on the Lagos roads, up to 12 attacks a day. Um, the piracy came to an end primarily because the oil price fell, the number of ships declined rather than any uh, particular activity uh, by the Nigerian authorities. But it continued at a much lower level, um, except that as recently as 2003, um, the 2002-2003 period, there were more attacks taking place off Nigeria uh, than were taking, off, taking place off Somalia where really instance only started to ramp up in 2004-2005. Now the whole history of this, I did have the right slide up there, didn't I? Um, is a story about oil and the consequences of oil wealth. Oil accounts for around right about 80% of the Nigerian government's income, and that's been fairly consistent since oil was discovered. Oh, sorry, oil was starting to be produced post-independence. Uh, as I said, following the uh, Biafran War, control of that revenue was, was centralized in the federal government. At the same time, uh, since independence, the regions have been split up at least twice, uh, and now you've got uh, really two constituencies, a series of oil-producing states and a series of non-oil-producing states, federally created, and the non-oil-producing states are a political counterpart. Uh, to the oil producing states. The disbursement formula known in Nigeria as derivation has changed several times over the past 40 years, but has always been uh, politically contentious. I'd say a huge proportion of the allocation, 75% went to the non oil producing states. Since then, it has drifted back. Low point was probably reached in 1985 when Rivers State, which is one of the main oil producing states, received only 3% of its income. Um, back to it from the federal government. It has since risen uh, by 2009 to uh, around about 13%. Okay, so money was flowing to the Delta, but little of it was trickling down to the people who actually lived there, whose experience continued to be one of pollution, uh, poverty, and neglect. And there's been a, there's been a history of defiance, even before the Biafran War. We had what was called the 12 Day Revolution uh, by the Niger, Niger Delta a Volunteer Force led by uh, Isaac Adaka Boro, who's a charming, slightly out of date photograph. You'll see that. Um, 
His revolt was put down, as I said, in 12 days. We had the Biafran War. The next demonstration of militancy came, a significant display of militancy came in 1919, with the movement for the survival of the Golden People, the Mossop, uh, led by uh, Ken Sara Wewa, again, portrait there. This is significant because uh, his, uh, the, the, um, his killing, if you like, his execution uh, by the uh, Abacha regime, him and his nine of his followers, really taught people in the Delta that nonviolent resistance was going to be confronted with by violence, and therefore there was every reason uh, to take up arms. By 2009, militants in numbers were believed to be around 50,000. To counter that, the federal government started to disperse more money down to the provinces, down to the states, uh, but all that really led to was, of course, uh, devolved corruption. And the, and the levels of the amount of money that we're talking about are considerable. Uh, 2009, rivers had an income of $2.9 billion. Uh, that's one state alone, $2.9 billion. What was happening, we were seeing the militants and the politicians within these states uh, working together to their mutual advantage. Looking, working together uh, in, in, in illegal bunkering. Links between uh, the People's Democratic Party and, and figures uh, such as Atake Tom and Dakota Asari uh, were, were legion. Interestingly, uh, Dakota Asari has just admitted uh, in an article in the Wall Street Journal about six weeks ago uh, that he probably, that he freely admits that he got his start, whether this is true or not, this is what he's saying, uh, that he got his start uh, when uh, <coughs> Gaddafi paid him $100,000 uh, to stir up trouble uh, in Nigeria because Gaddafi saw Nigeria as a threat. The most significant group to emerge, of course, the one that everyone knows as MEND, uh, Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta, uh, formed in 2005. Uh, in specifically in response to uh, arrest of several regional political leaders. It was formed by groups such as Dakota Asaris, by the Federation of the Niger Delta Ejol Communities and various cult groups. It would take a bit too long to go into what cult groups are, but they started their life probably in the early 1950s and ironically gave themselves titles such as the Pirates. Life is full of irony. Um, what men did was merge a number of bun uh, bunkering syndicates, attacked oil facilities, uh, and started kidnapping oil workers in January 2006. Most significant attack was that on the Bonga uh, oil, oil um, storage platform, <coughs> illustrated here, large red object, um, 2008, uh, which really changed the entire uh, field for security in the region. But, not, but men was never a unified entity. Uh, some judged it to be purely criminal, um, and other people, whilst conceding that criminality has always been a central feature of, uh, of the militancy in the region, have pointed out that the government's reluctance to secure areas other than oil producing areas uh, has led to a variety of militias appearing over the years, which have, in the end, all drifted into criminality. So men was not in any way different. Uh, Nigeria's uh, water work. Nigerian piracy is not confined uh, to the high seas. Of course, much of it takes place in uh, territorial waters and in the, uh, the rivers and creeks. Um, it is also, is it criminal or political? Uh, that is a question I think one can ask about piracy just about anywhere in the world. What makes um, Somali piracy and piracy in the Strait of Malacca unusual is that it is more clearly criminal uh, than political. That the ambiguity is much less. Liberal bunkering, hugely profitable, staggering losses, uh, $100 billion lost uh, since 1960. More oil is stolen in Nigeria than is produced in many African countries. The managing director of Shell, as uh, late as July this year, was saying illegal bunkering was now uh, out of control. Now, to get that in perspective, only a small proportion, relatively small proportion, is stolen at sea. Much more is lost through what's called hot tapping, which is taking the oil straight out of, the, out of the pipes, and out of fraud from the legal bunkering process. Now, this wouldn't happen, would not happen, without government, uh, Nigerian National Oil Company, and military complicity. 
several recognizable types of piracy around the world. The one that I think concerns us most in the, uh, the Gulf of Guinea is Type 4, uh, the major ship assaults. But all but five, uh, which was the Somali style, which is primarily one of uh, lifting hostages, uh, have taken place on Nigeria. Type 4 is the most serious and appears to have widespread uh, political uh, support and criminal connections. Thanks to St. You know, Julian of Assange, otherwise known as WikiLeaks, uh, we know that from leaked um, US government cables from the embassy of the United State Department, people who have been involved in this, include a former First Lady, I believe to be involved in it, a former First Lady, various Niger Nigerian businessmen, and various sh shady characters for around the world, including the Russian. Since 2010, we've seen attacks uh, spread uh, to Benin, the waters of Benin and Togo. Uh, we've seen the use of motherships. Most attacks are taking place on oil product tankers, fuel and crude tankers, uh, and there's a very steady and valuable uh, income to be made, talking about two to three attacks uh, per month. But one of the characteristics of Nigerian piracy, Gulf of Guinea piracy, is underreporting. I talk there are at least 50%. Frankly, that is probably the global average. Um, probably about 50% of the tax go unreported worldwide. It's probably less of Somalia because there's various reasons to, to report, uh, primarily because there's a belief that something will happen. And of course, if you're losing your crew, you have to tell somebody. Um, the, the, the level of unreporting of the Gulf of Guinea is probably much higher. People have talked about 80%, maybe 90% of the tax going unreported. Uh, sorts have also taken place, obviously, uh, on smaller craft. Now, the amnesty, uh, recognizing really that the um, coercive measures were achieving little, in 2009, the then president, um, Yaa Adua, uh, initiated, initiated an amnesty. This is the president for whom good luck, Jonathan, was the deputy. Then, this is a bold move. Uh, um, amnesties had been tried before, but this one uh, was much more complex, much more balanced. Uh, in, in return for surrendering weapons, uh, the militants uh, were given a minimum wage, which is actually three times what the, the national minimum wage was, uh, and training programs. Now, critics obviously say this is economically unsustainable, and that continues to be a, a, a refrain. Um, however, militants who did not surrender within the period, uh, and there were obviously good reasons why people were suspicious of the government's intentions, um, militants who did not surrender at the excluded, others have become uh, disillusioned. Because if the, uh, if the amnesty had a fatal flaw, it was this belief that what was taking place in the Delta uh, was purely criminal, large-scale organized crime, um, which has been, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, turned into a right predation. Essentially, peace uh, was bought, not built. And consequently, we've seen a rise relatively limited number so far of the so-called uh, third phase militants, such as this man, uh, Togo, uh, of the Niger Delta uh, Liberation Force, who came to a somewhat gruesome end, using men's tactics uh, for, for rather more limited reasons. So, coming to the conclusions. Um, in 2005, the, national, the US National Intelligence Council uh, predicted Nigeria would be a failed state by 2020. Now, arguably, it's a failed state already. Failed states, of course, have a number of definitions, uh, and sometimes it's in the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but oil states are shielded from the effects of their actions in the ways that non-oil states are not. International recognition depends upon legitimate, does not, depends um, on, not on internal legitimacy or functionality, uh, but uh, international recognition. Um, those parts that are valued by the industrial powers and by the local elites, as long as they work well enough for resource extraction, resource extraction uh, will continue. Yeah. I'll do my Oil emancipates states uh, from society. Perimeters can be drawn around these productive areas. Therefore, it, it is at least arguable that the dichotomy that I set up earlier between the positive and the negative view of what is happening in Nigeria is not entirely true. The two could exist side by side. Lagos, Lagos 
at Abuja and the oil fields. The consequence is that the Delta problems will not be addressed uh, with urgency because they seem to be manageable. Uh, time has been used to reinforce coercive powers. At sea, we see oil and, uh, oil and ships platforms must operate securely. Bonga attack demonstrated that those, uh, those facilities are uh, vulnerable, and so we've seen a process of um, hardening the rights of the private maritime security companies and reinforcement uh, of the Navy. Um, we've also seen uh, that the ships and platforms form the equivalent of uh, uh, platforms that we see at sea. Now, reform recommendations have been plentiful, but the obstacles to change uh, remain significant, and I would point to three. The first is the distorting effect of subsidies on Nigeria's internal energy market. Second, the difference that that leads to between oil prices and fuel prices in Nigeria and those of its neighbours that make smuggling so incredibly lucrative. And finally, the overriding problem of elite corruption. And that elite corruption seems to meet with an almost fatalistic acceptance. It is extraordinary that since oil was discovered in Nigeria, the country's GDP per capita has actually declined, and so has life expectancy. There is, at the same time, a coincidence of interest between the industrial powers and the elites. US oil dependence on Nigeria is expected to increase in the coming years. Oil supply, in the end, cannot be jeopardized. The language and methods of security will prevail. Thank you.